He's amazing, then you just haven't gotten close enough yet to find that out. <clears throat> God is awesome. My welcome to all the guests today. Could I have just a little bit more monitor, please? Thank you so much. Would you mind standing with me just for a moment as we give honor to the Word of God? I like that. They did it in the Word of God. They would read, and every time they would read, the congregation would stand in honor of the Word. We're just saying, God, I respect your Word. Looking at John chapter 4, verse 6. John chapter 4, verse 6. So glad you're all here today. I believe God has something great. I was finishing this up at 3 o'clock this morning. <laughs> I wish he wouldn't do that to me. Thanks for a long day. But I was so excited. I was just studying. I was so excited about the Word of God. I just uh, felt his wonderful presence. Maybe it was just for me, but I don't think so. I believe it was for all of us. John chapter 4 and verse 6. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman, verse 7, there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Jump to 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Verse 14. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up to everlasting life. Verse 28. The woman then left her water pot. This woman came to the well with a water pot to draw water for the usage of that day. But when she left Jesus, she left her temporary source behind. She brought the water pot, but Jesus said, if you ask me to drink, that I'm going to put a well in you springing up unto everlasting life. She brought a temporary thing and went away with something permanent. I want to preach this morning on renting versus owning. Renting versus owning. Would you put your Bibles down and just either lift your hands, put your hands together, just fold it in prayer. Jesus, we want to draw closer to you today. No matter where we are in you, I pray that the Word of God would lead us closer because you are an amazing God. And I pray that you would open our understanding. Help me to preach. Help me to teach as you gave it to me these last few days. And help me to paint a picture of excellence of you, God. Your word is powerful. Your word is true. And we want to receive it today unto ourselves. And we pray in Jesus' name. Everyone said in Jesus' name. Would you look at your neighbor and say, I'm ready to buy. <laughs> you may be seated. I am ready to buy. talking about water today. Genesis chapter 26, verse 12. I'm going to systematically go through this portion of Scripture because it is, it is so incredibly teaching. Uh, it says, Then Isaac sowed in the land and received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. Verse 14, for he had possession of flocks and possession of herds and great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. The enemy was, was jealous of Isaac for what God was doing for him. And in verse 15, for all the wells, everyone say wells, which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. The enemies came up and uh, filled up the wells that Abraham had dug. They filled them up with earth. 
You see, we have a, the ability to draw sustenance and nourishment from the well. We need water to survive. And the, the, the enemy decided that they would fill up those wells with earth. See, we can draw water out of a well, but if, we, if somebody were to fill that with dirt and, and gravel and clay, we would no longer be able to drink that water. It would stop that well from coming up. The enemy wants to fill up the wells that have been dug before us with clay, with worldliness. They want to take the earth and put it into the well that we draw from. The foolish thing is this, that if the enemy fills up the well, they neither can draw from that well. The enemy really is stupid. We give, the, we give Satan a lot of credit, but he really doesn't deserve any. The enemy wants to fill up the well, and yet when he does, he can no longer draw from it either. But he doesn't care about that because he would rather destroy than allow us to receive benefit from it. See, earth, worldliness, and self stop the flow of that. It's selfishness. We are made of the dust of the earth. We are made out of dirt. Dirt put into the well causes us to no longer be able to draw from that well. Genesis chapter 26 verse 17 says, And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. I looked up the meaning of the valley of Gerar, and it literally means torrent bed. It was a place where torrents of water flowed through. It was a valley. So when things began to melt in the spring, when the rains, when the spring rains came, there was a torrent of water that went through that place, and Isaac decided to pitch his tent to, to, to basically set up camp in a place where water flows. I have a feeling today that you are sitting right in the middle of a valley. You are sitting in a place where water flows. It doesn't flow all the time, but there are times when a mighty rushing river begins to move through this valley, and Isaac planted his tent there, and he was saying, I'm going to put myself right in the middle of a place where a river flows. I want to be here when the water flows. And I believe today that there are some people here that are going to feel that mighty rushing river of the power of God flow through this congregation, and you're going to feel God. But while Isaac was waiting for the rivers to come, he said, I'm going to dig. I'm going to dig out the wells that the enemy has filled up. He didn't wait for things to happen. He said, I'm going to initiate it myself. I'm thirsty, and I'm going to do something about it. Verse 18 says, And Isaac digged again the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of of Abraham. Notice how the enemy waited for the umbrella of authority to leave to challenge the next generation. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. The enemy was afraid of Abraham. The enemy didn't want to challenge Abraham. Abraham had settled things with God a long time ago, but the enemy waited for Abraham to move on and then decided we would fill up the wells and challenge this next generation. Some of the temporary blessings that we enjoy from the rewards of other people's labor there's people that have gone before us and have dug wells, and we enjoy the rewards of that. But sooner or later, the people that you rely upon for sustenance of the Word of God, they're going to be gone, and the enemy is going to challenge you. He's going to say, I'm not going to challenge Abraham because Abraham wouldn't fail. But I want to know what you believe. Do you have a well of your own? Do you have a well of your own, or are you relying upon the wells of those that have gone on before? <clears throat> So he will challenge you 
Some of us enjoy the presence of God, and yet we've never even put a shovel to the ground of our own spiritual well-being. We merely come and we say, well, thank you, Pastor Jans, for digging a well. Thank you for giving us all of that water. And someday, if he, if he ends up leaving this earth, God's going to say, where's your well? Did the enemy come in and fill that up? Because you, we have no idea what they have done, what they have done going on before us, digging those wells. But the enemy's going to come in, and he's going to say, are you willing to dig out this well? Are you willing to take this on your own? And notice the second part of that. He called their names after the names by which his father had called. He didn't change the name. He hung on to the name. Eventually, if we want water, we're going to have to dig it out for ourselves. When Isaac found the well that Abraham had dug, it wasn't very appealing up front. You know, truth right up front is not real appealing. You walk into the church and people are jumping and shouting and rolling on the floor and and doing all sorts of crazy things and you think, this isn't real appealing to me. Your flesh is saying, get me out of here. But it's, but, but, but it's all covered up with earth. What I'm saying is you're looking at the physical part of it. But underneath there, there is a river flowing that will give you nourishment if you wait long enough. But it, when, when we dig out the well, when we get our flesh out of the way, we, then all of a sudden a well begins to look better. And the truth is this. When Isaac began digging, Isaac looked at the top, but he said, I see what it looks like on the surface, but I know I was raised in this. My dad dug those wells. I drank out of those wells when I was a kid. I know what's underneath all of that earth. I know that there is crystal clear water underneath that dirt. But it's amazing. We look and say it's hard labor to dig. Is it really worth all the struggle? But folks, it's amazing what a person will do when they're dying of thirst. When you look at this world and it never satisfies you, when you reach for something and it never quenches that deep thirst within your heart, when you try this and try that and say, that didn't do it, little bit of a temporary flare, but you know what, I'm empty, I'm destitute, I'm still looking, I'm still searching for God, but all of a sudden you get a taste of the real spring water and you go, that's what I'm looking for. In fact... Isaac didn't change things just because dad was gone. In fact, he went back to the same place that dad found water and didn't change the name. If we want to drink out of the wells that the apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul, and Matthew, and Mark, and Luke, and John drank of. We're not going to find it in some new revelation. We're not going to find it doing some new thing. We're going to go have, we're going to have to go back to the same well that Abraham dug. We're going to have to dig it out of the same place, and we have to make sure that we never change the name. Hmm. The herdsman of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, the water is ours. And he called the name of the well Essek, because they strove with him. Essek, the first well, was named contention. It means struggling together in opposition, strife, a striving in rivalry, competition, contest, strife in debate, dispute, controversy, a point contended for or affirmed in controversy, which tells me the first well was named controversy because it was more of a mental and a verbal challenge. They literally said, hey, that's ours. And there was a verbal and mental dispute over it. When you, if we want the spring water that gives real life, we're going to have to first decide for ourselves. It's going to come to us in our brain. And we're going to look at this and say, I don't know about this. And I'm not sure about this. And I don't think about this. And and, and there's going to be controversy that comes. But if we think life is going to come without a struggle, we have totally ignored nature itself. Birth is always 
a struggle. Jesus said, except you are born again of water and spirit, you're not going to see or enter heaven. Birth is always a struggle because there's always danger in the beginning due to vulnerability. The coyotes in our area, they love it when deer are first born. They're vulnerable. They're slow. They can't walk real good. And they take them out. A lot of fawns go to, co to coyote death because they're vulnerable. Not only that, but while the mother is giving birth, she's vulnerable. She can't run like she used to be able to run. So they know, they watch, they follow, and they wait because we'll, we're vulnerable. If we want to find this water, it's going to be found in the same place our fathers found it. They dug it out with blood, sweat, and tears. The good thing is, is that they first located it for us. They literally said, there's water here. Even if the enemy fills it up with a bunch of junk, we know there's water there. It flowed for them. It'll flow for us if we're willing to dig it out. We're not going to find it in a new place. We're going to find it exactly where the apostles found it. So the first one is mental and verbal. The second, they digged another well and strove for that also, and he called the name of it, Sitna, the second well is called strife. It means, it's a, it's a different word, it means vigorous or bitter conflict, discord or antagonism to be at strife, a quarrel, a struggle, a clash, an armed strife, competition or rivalry, strenuous effort. Different word. This indicates a physical struggle. The first struggle when we come to God will be mental. We'll have to try to figure this all out and decide, do we really want to pay the price? The second thing will be a physical struggle. It will be something that the devil says, oh, but you might have to give up this. You might have to do this. It's not a mental struggle. It's a physical struggle. It means we're still too close to the enemy to avoid his influence. We're coming out of the enemy. We're saying, I want this real truth. I want what's right for me. Even if I have to adjust some things, I want what's right. But yet we're still too close to the enemy, and the enemy keeps grabbing onto us and saying, no, don't do that, and don't do this, and, and be careful of this. The third well it says, he removed from thence, in verse 22, and digged another well, and for that they strove not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth. And he said, For now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. The third well is called Rehoboth, which means wide place or street, room for us all. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 22, And let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. This is a well that says there's room for all of us. There's no more strife. There's no more contention. There's water for everybody that's thirsty. Roominess, because it was far enough away to not be a problem. The Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. The Bible says there was room in the third well. They had moved far enough away from their enemy to where they could dig a well and he couldn't get to them. They said, oh, you're already too far gone. We're going to let you go. Are you hearing what I'm saying today? If living for God seems to be a constant struggle for you, maybe you're living too close to the enemy. Wow. It's not supposed to be hard to live for God. We do have our, our challenges. But if this is a daily thing and every time you go to the well, there's dirt in the well, then you're living too close to the enemy. The enemy still has too much influence in your life. Verse 23, and he went up from thence to Beersheba. God used the conflicts to lead Isaac back to Beersheba, where Abraham had been before. God doesn't want us to live in contention and opposition but those can be used by God to lead us to the place 
where he wants us to be. God allows contention sometimes and allows conflict to get our attention. He literally puts roadblocks in our life and says, I'm trying to have mercy on your life. Someone says, well, you know, I got stopped by an officer. He threw me in jail or I, had a, I, I got a sickness in my life. I've seen that happen so many times and I've seen people in the hospital get salvation. God stopped them in their track and said, I'm trying to save you, but you won't listen to me. So I'm going to let something happen that will get your attention so I can talk to you. The Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. Verse 25, and he builded an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants digged a well. Verse 32, and it came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which they had digged, and said unto him, We have found water. 33, And he called it Sheba. Therefore the name of the city is Beersheba unto this day. According to the resources I looked up, Beersheba, here the name is ascribed to the Hebrew root, Shaba, which means to swear a covenant, or a promise. He dug a well or redug a well that was called swear, covenant, promise. But the same root of that word is also connected with the idea of seven. God's number of completeness. The Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth and all that therein is in seven days. It says he rested on the seventh day. We also look at Jericho. They were to march around that city for seven days in a row and seven times on the seventh day, and God gave them victory. In our original text this afternoon, I read about a woman that was at a well. She ended up talking to Jesus, and Jesus looked at her, and he said, would you please call your husband? She said, I don't have a husband. He said, you just told me the truth, because you've had five husbands, and the guy you're living with right now is not your husband, which is number six. Jesus said, introducing number seven, I'm here. I'm perfect and I'm complete. Jesus was there to complete her life. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of Yahweh, the everlasting God. God appeared in an angelic form to Hagar, to Isaac, to Jacob, and to Elijah at that same well. So, this well that Isaac had dug, number seven, This well had to do with promise, with the name. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. It had to do with promise, the name of God, completeness, and the presence of God. When he talked about receiving the Holy Ghost, he said, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. It has to do with the name. It has to do with completeness. It has to do with the presence of God. Wells were needed in travel in those days. You could only carry so much water with you. Eventually, you needed to fill up. So without water, you would either die in the wilderness or be forced to stay where your last source of water is. God wants us to make progress. God wants us to know that as we travel towards him, that there are wells along the way that we can draw from. We don't ever have to worry about dying in the wilderness because of a lack of water. As long as we keep following him, there will be wells to draw from. 
I know it's easier to plug a well than it is to dig one out. But Paul said we need to fight the good fight of faith. They dug out a well to survive. People think that coming to God is merely you show up and say, everything's been done for me. I just need to enjoy salvation. But friend of mine, Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. He said, if you're going to be saved, you're going to have to get a shovel and you're going to have to dig a well. So, it's more beneficial and easier to protect our source than have to remove the earth every time we need a drink. Do you hear what I'm saying? <clears throat> there are those that come to church every Thursday and every Sunday, and their wells are full of the world. Their wells are full of earth, selfishness, contention, and strife. They have allowed the enemy to go up to their well and fill it full of self and world. And every time they come to church, they have to dig out the well again. Oh, wouldn't it be easier today just to protect the well and keep the enemy from showing up? Makes it such a struggle when you come to God. Every time we preach and every time we teach, we struggle to get all of the dirt out of our hearts, to get down to where that spring water is. And we finally get there and we're renewed in God and everything seems fine. And then we go home and we begin to throw all the dirt kick all this junk back into the well so that when we try to find God again, we look at it and eventually we look at that well and say, oh, forget it. It's too much work. We know where the water is. We just need to make up our mind that we're going to go get it. Isaiah, I'm almost done. Isaiah 12, verse 3, Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. Isaiah prophesied by saying, salvation will come, but you're going to have to draw it. Drawing had nothing to do with receiving it from above. Drawing had everything to do with taking a pail, tying it to a rope, and lowering it into a well, and then lifting that pail back up out of the water. It was work to draw water out of a well. The Bible says faith without works is dead. Faith is the beginning, but it's going to take some works to get salvation out of the well. There's some things that we have to do to draw that water up. So first he said, he prophesied, salvation would require a drawing out of the wells. The second part of that is this. He did not say that with joy we draw water out of the well. He said out of the wells, plural. Salvation is not an event in our life. Salvation is a continual journey it's from well to well to well. We need to move along and start to say, God, what else do you have for me in this well? If you've met God before and you came to him and said, God, I'm so sorry for all that I've done. I'm sorry for all the sin that I've brought upon myself. And you begin to weep and cry in the carpet and you say, God, please forgive me. That's well number one. But there's more. There's more. Don't just stop there. Say, God, where's the next well? I'm willing to dig it out if it's full of garbage. I'll dig it out because I want more of God. 
2 Peter chapter 2 says these are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest. He's talking about wells and clouds that are hypocritical. They don't have water in them. These are people or places that look like they should have water, but they're empty. Don't blame it on people that call, it, call themselves Christians. Well, they call themselves Christians and they act like the devil. Really? Then their wells are full of garbage. Their wells are full of dirt and rock and earth. Somebody who's full, somebody who's got the spring water deep inside them, that's the person you want to draw from. Give me some pure water. Don't judge Jesus based upon somebody else's dirty well. There is a river that Jesus offers that is so crisp and clean. I hope to God you're thirsty today because I'm thirsty for more of him. I want all of God that I can get. I want some clean water today. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well springing up unto everlasting life. He said, you don't understand. You have drunk from the waters of this world. You'll have to keep going back looking for satisfaction, but the water that I give, I'm going to take a well of crisp, clean water and put it inside of you so you can protect it from the enemy. That way, the only way they can get it in there, any dirt in there, is you need to welcome it in. You need to say, go ahead and put that junk in my well. God said, I'm going to put this well inside of you. Whenever, wherever, whatever state you're in, whatever city you're in, whatever house you're in, you can reach into that well of living water and draw from it and be satisfied. Jesus said in that last day, that great day of the feast, he stood and cried saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Would you stand with me today? He said there is going to be a river of living water, sparkling, crisp, clear water. He said, I'm talking about the Spirit of God that will be put inside of you. It will be crisp and clean, and it will satisfy your soul. Last scripture, Ezekiel 47. It goes to talk about before that, it says, I saw waters coming out of the side of the altar. Those waters ran, and they began to grow, and got to my ankles. And then it got to my knees. And then it got to my thigh. And then it was over my head. It says, waters to swim. Waters to swim in. And then he says this, it shall come to pass that everything that lives, that moves, wherever the river shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish because these waters shall come thither or close for they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. Things live wherever water touches. What he's saying is, think about Israel in the dusty, stony ground of Israel. It was useless to them. <clears throat> and they got the bright idea of irrigating. Let's bring water into the land. They brought water into the land and now it's a plush, plush garden where dusty ground was. Why? Because water was introduced. Your life is dry and dull and cracked. And God says, I've got a river that wants to flow into your dry, 
crusty, parched land. And when my water touches your heart, right, Michael? Alive. That water comes into a life that is useless and full or, or full of valueless stuff. And the water touches our life. And next thing you know, things begin to grow. Things begin to come alive. Right, Mike? I'm telling you, you have no idea what life is until this river comes close. You think we're all crazy? We found the river. We found the river of life. We come to God whenever we need something. Like the woman at the well, we bring our container and dip it in the well of God's blessing. When it runs out, we need to make the spiritual trek or journey back to the well again, which is temporary. God wants us to take the well home with us today. If you've already received the well, and yet you have contention and strife, we need to dig out the well today and say, God, take that junk out of my heart. I haven't tasted that crisp, clear water for a while. I need you to take those rocks and the dirt out of my heart. If you've never had the well, if you've never stepped into the glory of God and it felt, it felt like the river was gushing out of your spirit and you were like, oh God, this is incredible. That's available today. Would you bow your heads with me just for a moment? Jesus, you so want to help us today. There are people that are afraid. They feel like God, Pentecost is some kind of denomination, and it's not. It's merely identification with an experience that began on the day of Pentecost. It's when the dam broke and the river began to flow. The river of life that touched many of us here today, that brought life to a dead soul. What did you say, Jesus? You said, and you that were dead in trespasses and sins. Hath he made alive? Lord, how did you make us alive when we were dead in sin? You let the blood flow and you let the water flow in our life and it gave us new life. I pray, Lord, that you would create a thirst in the hearts of everyone here today that they would want to come to this altar for the water is flowing from the altar. It's flowing to satisfy the soul that is thirsty for you, Jesus. If you're thirsty for God today, if you have no idea if you're thirsty for God today, I invite you to come to this altar and say, Lord, this water that he's talking about, I've never been satisfied by going to a church. I've never been satisfied in my journey, in my search for you, God. I want to be satisfied today. I promise you that satisfaction is at this altar. If you'll come, look at your neighbor and say, let's go get a drink. Let's go drink from this well of life that God has given. Come on, if you're just so afraid to come to the altar, would you just kneel at your pew and just say, God, I want you to touch me. If what this preacher is saying is true, I want that in my life. I want to experience the great glory of God. Go ahead and sing, Jesus. Into your arms I'm drawing near again to dwell with I said, reach out to him. My Lord, I'm thirsty for you. I'm thirsty for you, Jesus. I'm thirsty. I desire your presence right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.